and that would certainly be Micah Schwartzman. You know him as the past president of CBI and CBI board member. And many of you know of his distinguished career as a law professor at UVA, legal theorist, and director of the Karsh Center for Law and Democracy. He has specialized in issues concerning church and state, the Constitution, and religious liberty. In addition to publishing scholarly articles in important law reviews, Micah is a public intellectual. He has written opinion pieces in such publications as the New York Times, The Atlantic, The New Republic, and Slate. Among the courses he is teaching now, one is entitled Religious Freedom and Reproductive Rights. And Michael will address that very issue with us here today. Thank you, Micah. Thanks. Thanks so much for the introduction uh, and for inviting me uh, to uh, talk with you about this topic. Um, can you hear me? And, I, and that's going to be good for your purposes. OK, great. Uh, all right, so my title today is Religious Freedom and Abortion. Uh, so. Um, not controversial issues. We're not going to talk about <laughs> anything he did. Um, these are obviously sensitive topics, uh, and I will um, try to approach them in that spirit. I want to talk mostly here about the about the law of these issues, the constitutional law of these issues. Although we can talk some about um, Jewish ethics uh, as well. I'm not an expert uh, in Jewish ethics, um, but I but I think I know enough to um, help put the pieces uh, here together. Um, my subtitle is, Can Liberal Jews Have Religious Freedom? And I hope that the uh, subtitle will become um, uh, more sensible, that you'll have a better idea of what it means by the time that we're done. I'll try to explain uh, how, how that question comes to be. Let me, uh, let me get started by, hopefully this is working. Um, yeah, good. Um, by mentioning that the subject matter of this talk arises from some current litigation, from pending cases. We currently have constitutional challenges, mostly involving state law pending uh, in six or seven states uh, around the country. These cases involve religious liberty challenges to restrictions on abortion that came into effect after the Supreme Court overruled Roe v. Wade, which had constitutionalized a right to terminate pregnancy. After that decision was overruled in a case called Dobbs, which you'll recall uh, from last year. Um, after Dobbs, many states pass restrictions of various types, uh, including some states with categorical prohibitions on abortion. And in some of those states, we currently have challenges, some at the state level, some at the federal level, uh, on religious freedom grounds. There's a wide range of other kinds of challenges to these restrictions. You might have seen in the news that Pennsylvania just declared a state constitutional right last week to abortion. Um, I'm not going to talk about those types of challenges. I'm really here just focused on claims of religious liberty. The, the case that's furthest along in all of these uh, states is one uh, in Indiana. Um, that case uh, went to a trial court in December, um, not of this past year, but the year before. Uh, on December 6th, just this past December 2023, the Indiana uh, Court of Appeals heard an appeal in that case. Uh, I, I frankly expected that appeal not to go very well, but it turned out the panel was quite sympathetic uh, to the plaintiffs in the case. The plaintiff group uh, in the case is called Hoosiers Jews for Choice. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So uh, many of these cases involve uh, claims brought by reformed Jews. In fact, the leading plaintiffs in Indiana, and the next most important case I think is coming out of Kentucky, and I'll talk to you more about that uh, in a few minutes. But those cases, Indiana uh, is the group that I mentioned, um, and some anonymous plaintiffs in Kentucky, we have got three named plaintiffs, all reform and conservative Jews. So I think, uh, I think the Jewish community has a real stake in, in these cases, uh, not only because of the nature of the plaintiffs, but because of the values and the ideas that they represent. So these cases are happening, and I think uh, I take my job in this talk to be to try to explain to you, to help you understand sort of the, the law behind them and why uh, why they might have more legs than, uh, than you might otherwise think. Uh, at least that's the, that's the gist of what I want to talk about. But I, uh, let me just give you a brief overview of how this is going to go. I want to say something about the First Amendment because uh, I don't assume any familiarity with it. You know, you know about freedom of speech and you know about religious liberty, but I just want to show you the text for a moment. I'll talk to you about an important objection to the kinds of suits that, uh, that we'll be focusing on here. 
I want to talk a little bit about the rise of religious exemptions over the last several years in the current Supreme Court, especially having to do with uh, COVID. Then we'll look at these religious uh, freedom and abortion cases, and then I'll come back to my subtitle. And I'm going to try and do all that in about 20 minutes, believe it or not. Yeah. <laughs> then that way we've got about half an hour for Q&A. No, no, this is going to fly, so you'll, you'll just have to keep up with me. But I, it's, not, it's not my first time, so we'll, 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 yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll try. If maybe it takes half an hour, but we're, we're going we're gonna to work through it. Okay, so this is the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. There's some other stuff. There's like freedom of speech, freedom of the press. All right, we're just going to bracket all that. I just want to focus on these. I put the, the numbers in. That's me, not, not actually in the text of the Constitution. But the, the numbers there are meant to, to uh, signify two clauses that, uh, or maybe one clause, but I've broken it into two parts that have to do with, uh, with religious freedom. These are sometimes referred to as the religion clauses of the First Amendment. The first is sometimes called the Establishment Clause. And Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. We can't have a national religion or an established religion. Um, and the second uh, says that, uh, that Congress shall make no law uh, prohibiting the free exercise thereof, which refers back to religion. Right? And this is sometimes called the Free Exercise Clause. So I wanna, I wanna talk mainly today about free exercise claims. That is, arguments that are raised under uh, this provision of the Constitution or under provisions in state constitutions that are very similar. Uh, there are arguments, and in fact, I think these are even more intuitive arguments for most people uh, raised against abortion prohibitions under the Establishment Clause. And those arguments go something like this. What's wrong with a prohibition on abortion is that it imposes a certain view about when life begins. And that's to impose a religious perspective. And what's an establishment of religion? It's the imposition by the government of a certain religious perspective. And so these laws seem to respect an establishment of religion. They impose a certain religious view. I'm actually not going to talk about that kind of argument, even though I think it's fairly familiar, and even though it's had some prominence over the years. Um, I th that argument, uh, I think, is fairly well understood and for various reasons that we can talk about maybe in Q&A has been mostly rejected by the courts. Here I want to focus on arguments that are made under the Free Exercise Clause, that is, that go to the idea of individual religious uh, liberty. Because these are novel kinds of claims. That, uh, at least we haven't seen them in the, the courts for, for de many decades now. And I think they're a little bit harder uh, to track and to understand. And I, I try to want to... Uh, um, help work, work us up to um, seeing how these arguments are being presented. So that's all by way of introduction to the First Amendment. To raise a claim for a religious exemption or an accommodation from a law, including uh, an abortion uh, prohibition, any religious plaintiff has to make out three basic elements. And these are, I think, fairly intuitive. You have to say that you're, in order to claim an exemption, that you're uh, you're appealing to some religious belief or practice that might seem kind of obvious in order to, to raise a claim under the free exercise clause of the First Amendment. That is a clause pr protecting religious liberty. You have to say you're doing something religious or that you have some religious beliefs that the law is infringing upon. You have to be sincere. Again, that shouldn't be terribly surprising. If you weren't sincere, your claim would be fraudulent and no court would want to hear a fraudulent claim about your free exercise. And you have to say that the law substantially burdens you. That is, if you followed your religious practice as you understand it, that the law would impose some kind of penalty on you. It would throw you in jail or fine you or do something that's not very nice that would, that would put you under pressure to give up your religious practice. Um, I just set out these elements because I, uh, they form part of the framework of thinking about religious liberty in our tradition, and I, I will come back to them at the very end. If you can show this, if you can show that you have a religious belief or practice that some law burdens in a significant way, and if you're sincere, for many years the Supreme Court, and you don't have to read any of this text, I put it up just as a marker for the moment. Um, for many years the Supreme Court applied a fairly stringent level of review to those claims. That is, if, if you could show that a law burdened your religious practice, then the Supreme Court required the state to come forward with what was in the lingo called a compelling interest. That is a really good reason, a powerful reason, for why the state should have the right to override or to coerce you despite your, your religious belief or practice. And it also had to show what, again, in the lingo is called the least restrictive means. That is to say, if the state could achieve its purposes or its ends without 
coercing your religious belief, if there was some other way the state could do what it wanted to do without forcing you to abandon your religious practice, then it had to adopt those alternatives. And so if there were any serious alternatives available to the state, then it should let you uh, live according to your religious belief and pursue those other alternatives and not force you to abandon your religious practice, or at least at the pain of some legal penalty. This was the regime, the constitutional regime, that the United States worked under for about 30 years, from 1960 or so to 1990. And then something in 1990 changed quite profoundly. So for a while we had, a, under our constitutional law, anytime someone brought a claim that said, this law really burdens my religious belief or practice, the state had to come forward with a really good reason to show that it needed to do that and that its law was, uh, there were not, not really good alternatives to the law uh, in order to justify that kind of burden. But then in 1990, we got a case involving um, two Native Americans and the use of peyote. I didn't know what peyote looked like, so I had to Google it. <laughs> so this is what peyote looks like. Every year I teach my students, and I put the picture of, of, uh, of peyote up on the, on the screen. There are a bunch of other drug cases, and I have to look those up too. Um, <laughs> Waska is another important one. Um, you've got these small groups, sometimes larger, with Native American groups that want to use these drugs. In 1992, Native Americans brought a claim. Uh, they were fired from their jobs, uh, and they wanted to get unemployment compensation benefits, and the state said no, Oregon State said no. And, and they said, well, you should grant us an accommodation from the law. Right? The state should have to show that it has a really powerful reason not to let us use peyote in our religious rights, uh, and it should show that there aren't al alternative means of achieving whatever interests in public health or in preventing people from taking dangerous drugs but it should let us use peyote. And the Supreme Court said no, and very much changed the way it approached this question about religious liberty. And it did so in an opinion by Justice uh, Antonin Scalia, who you may recall, um, most of you, I suppose, you my students in my classes, they don't remember Justice Scalia. It's like, you don't remember, uh, no, I can't say what I wanted to say. You, you, you don't remember the old regime, right? Um, there comes a generation that did not know. Um, they didn't know uh, Justice Scalia. Justice Scalia had an objection. And here's the objection. He said that any society adopting such a system, and by the system he meant any society that says that if you have a religious belief or practice that's burdened, and if you apply this test that I've been describing, the state has to come forward with a really powerful reason, really good reason, has to show that it doesn't have alternatives. If you apply that framework, he said, a society would be courting anarchy and then he said, but that danger increases in direct proportion to the society's diversity of religious beliefs and its determination to coerce or suppress none of them. Basically, Scalia's idea was this. If we let these Native Americans use peyote, that is, if we let anybody who happens to have a religious objection to some law come forward and on that basis demand that the state grant an accommodation, let them out from underneath that law, unless the state has really powerful reasons and unless the state can jump through all these hoops and show that it has alternatives, it's going to be a mess. Right? Every law will be challenged. Our society is incredibly diverse religiously. All kinds of laws are going to be subject to very stringent review in the courts, and that is going to be courting anarchy. And in my classes, I put an anarchy symbol up, just so you'll, re <laughs> you'll remember the, an the anarchy objection. Justice Scalia's objection to, to the Supreme Court mandating religious accommodations was an anarchy objection. He thought, it's just not workable. We can't have all these religious minorities coming to the court and demanding that we grant them religious accommodations. Justice Scalia's objection um, applied to a certain subset of laws. He said, uh, uh, wait a second, am I ahead of myself? Yeah. Um, he said, yeah, good. Um, that the right of free exercise does not relieve an individual of the obligation to comply with a valid and neutral law of general applicability on the ground that the law prescribes conduct that his religion prescribes. And all that is by sort of fancy way of saying, as long as the law is general, applies to all of us, as long as the law wasn't meant to target some religious group, to persecute them, to discriminate against them purposefully, as long as the law had a legitimate justification, and it was applied to everyone in an equal way, then the Supreme Court was not going to require accommodations. That was the force of the peyote case. And that case made a lot of people really angry. Congress passed a law called the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which some of you might have heard of in a case called Hobby Lobby. 
Anyway, Congress passed that law unanimously in the House and almost unanimously in the Senate. Bill Clinton signed it in 1992, so it had very widespread support, basically to overturn the decision in the peyote case. A lot of people were really unhappy with that decision by the majority of the court led by Justice Scalia. But the, but the takeaway for, for us is that any law that's neutral and generally applicable is not one that the Supreme Court or any other federal court because of the Supreme Court's supremacy, but any other federal court was going to grant an accommodation from. After this decision, the peyote case, all the action in religious liberty jurisprudence and all the cases that came after this, they were all about whether a law can be shown to be neutral and generally applicable. If you could show that a law wasn't generally applicable, that it didn't apply to everyone in an equal way, then, then you might be able to get an accommodation. But if the law was neutral in general, then you were out of luck, basically. That was, I mean, I'm simplifying a little bit, but that's basically the story. From 1990 to about 2017, the Supreme Court grants no exceptions, no religious accommodations, not a single one. There's one case uh, involving what I think most people would describe as a form of persecution in 1993, but aside from that, no exemptions after the peyote decision. So it really restricts the case law uh, under uh, the First Amendment. But while all this is happening, there's beginning to be some inklings of how the Supreme Court might wrangle its way out of this box that it has put religious liberty into. And the first major case that I want to tell you about um, involves um, two police officers in Newark, New Jersey. This case called Fraternal Order of Police Against the City of Newark. They want to wear long beards. They're Muslim, and, they, and following their be the religious beliefs, they want to wear uh, beards, and they're forbidden from doing so by the police department's uniform standards. That is, the department says you have to be clean shaven. The law applies to everyone. It wasn't meant to discriminate against any particular religious group. Right? They want police officers to be identifiable and in uniform. And these officers say, uh, say this is an infringement of our religious liberty. We have a sincere religious belief, right? That we need to we're required to wear a beard. Right? This shouldn't be foreign to our community. Uh, and and under the peyote case, it looks like they're going to lose because the law is not targeting their religious beliefs or, uh, for discrimination. But, um, but a judge on the uh, Third Circuit Court of Appeals, which is the court that sits in uh, New Jersey, um, held otherwise. That judge was, uh, was Sam Alito when he was uh, on the Third Circuit. He's now on the Supreme Court, as you know. Uh, he had a very clever idea, and the idea was this. The city of Newark was basically required under uh, federal law, the uh, Americans with Disability Act, to grant a medical exception to its uh, uniform requirement. That is, officers who suffered from skin disease called folliculitis were entitled to a medical exception from the uniform uh, requirement to be clean shaven. And Alito said, if the um, city of Newark grants any secular exceptions, any exceptions for secular activities, including this medical exception, then it, it must also grant a religious exception, or it has to have a really good reason not to do that. That is, the medical exception undermines the state's interest in having a uniform police corps, right? Some people with folliculitis are going to be unshaven, and that detracts from the uniformity of the police. Uh, and Alito said it devalues uh, religion to favor a secular exception, the medical exception here, over a religion. And the First Amendment, he says, forbids that kind of devaluing. You can't favor secular interests, even medical interests, over religious interests. That's the nature of his argument. And he says, if a law has even a single secular exception, then it's not generally applicable under the peyote case. And so Alito says, fine, it's not generally applicable, and you have, at that point, you have to take a hard look at whether the state has a reason for preferring a medical interest here, folliculitis, over a religious interest that is allowing these Muslim uh, police officers to wear beards in conformity with their religious beliefs. And he says, I don't see any reason to favor one interest over the other, and so he grants the exception. That creates a really interesting, um, interesting uh, development in our understanding of religious freedom, and now litigants begin to make arguments. Well, if there are any exceptions that protect secular activities from the rule, then it looks like there might be pressure to grant religious exceptions. That idea doesn't really take hold in the lower courts. Alito was really the first to articulate it in, in New Jersey in 1999. Um, but it begins uh, to get traction, and then it 
Uh, then it emerges as a real force during COVID. And let me give you some cases to help explain why. Uh, did it go forward? Oh, here we go. This is Andy Bashir. He's the governor of Kentucky. And in the midst of COVID, like lots of other governors, he passed a lot of regulations that required lockdowns and in-person closures, including some that applied to churches, right? as we know from our experience at CBI. And he was sued pretty early in the pandemic in the first summer, March of 2020. Um, or I guess uh, this case is from 2021, 20, I suppose. But um, in any event, the lawsuit basically contended that if the state was going to allow some types of facilities to be open, grocery stores and bike shops and uh, um, maybe hospitals, bus stations, and so on, then they had to impose the same capacity restrictions on churches. That is, churches couldn't be subject to more stringent social gathering rules than these other types of venues were. And here, uh, the litigants invoke the idea that Justice then Judge Alito had mentioned in the Fraternal Order case. That is, if you grant secular exceptions, exceptions for secular activities, you also have to grant religious exceptions. And the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals that sits in a in Ohio and the surrounding states, um, went with an argument like that. And here's what the court said. It said, the exception for life-sustaining businesses allows law firms, laundromats, liquor stores, gun shops to continue to operate so long as they follow social distancing and other health-related precautions. But the orders do not permit soul-sustaining groups, services of faith organizations, even if the groups adhere to all the public health guidelines required of essential services. So the, so the court said, if you grant life-sustaining exemptions, you also have to grant soul-sustaining exceptions, at least when they pose the same kinds of risk to the state's interest, that is, to preventing contagion and the harms of COVID, right? You can see how the, how the same kind of logic goes. If you want folliculitis exceptions, then you've got to grant religious exceptions. If you grant exceptions for liquor stores and laundromats, you have to grant exceptions for churches as well. This argument shall I say, metastasizes. It becomes more important as the personnel on the Supreme Court begins to shift. Um, um, it becomes quite significant in a set of cases involving vaccinations. So uh, in the, after the COVID vaccine uh, is distributed, it becomes mandatory in some states, especially for healthcare workers. Maine uh, and New York have uh, vaccine mandates, some others do too, but vaccine mandates for their healthcare workers, and they face the same kinds of challenges. All these vaccine requirements have exceptions for those who are medically contraindicated. Grant an exception for folliculitis, right? Grant an exception for those who are medically contraindicated, and the argument is you should have to grant exceptions for those who have religious objections to being vaccinated. The court in New York and in Maine reject this argument, and they say the state has a really powerful interest not to extend religious exemptions. And the Supreme Court balks at this point, it doesn't take these cases, but some other courts including one in the Sixth Circuit, uh, one in the Fifth, that's in Ohio and in Texas, and some other states. Um, they see cases involving military service members. Um, the case uh, in the Sixth Circuit in Ohio had 10,000 members of the U.S. Air Force, for example. Those courts granted vaccine exemptions for religious purposes on this kind of theory, that if you grant secular medical exceptions, you must also grant other exceptions. There were dissents from the Supreme Court's unwillingness to hear this case. Three conservative justices, you may recognize some of them, Justice Thomas on my right, Justice Alito, who's a familiar figure from, from the Fraternal Order case, Justice Gorsuch on my left. They said the Supreme Court should hear this case, and it's very likely that because there are medical or secular exceptions to these vaccine rules, then you should have to grant religious exceptions as well. That's the logic, okay? But we're a long way from Justice Scalia's anarchy objection, right? All laws have secular exceptions of one kind or another, and their argument is if there are these su such exceptions, then we ought to have to grant religious accommodations as well. You might be able to see where this is going, right? So let me turn from, from beard, you know, uh, grooming requirements in New Jersey to uh, social gathering restrictions to vaccines to turn from those cases uh, to abortion. Uh, this is um, Ben Potash and Lisa Sobel. She's a member of a reform congregation called the Temple in Louisville, Kentucky, a very old congregation going back uh, to, I think, just after the Civil War. They file a case in Kentucky 
There's a similar case I mentioned earlier pending further along actually in Indiana in the Court of Appeals. And what's the argument? There are a couple different kinds of arguments, but one really important argument is that all of these abortion prohibitions that the states enact after Dobbs have secular exceptions of various kinds. And if you're going to grant a secular exception, you know how this goes now, right? If you have to grant a secular exception that undermines the state's interest, then you'll also have to grant a religious exception. And they, uh, there, there are the plaintiffs, uh, there are lawyers in the back, Ben Hoodhash, Aaron Kemper, uh, and three uh, women who are named plaintiffs out of uh, two congregations in Louisville. Uh, the lawyers were uh, fellow congregants, in fact, of um, two of the plaintiffs. I think they had a book group after Dobbs, or at least one of them told me and said, we, we would think about suing the state. <laughs> one of the lawyers said, really? <laughs> and lo and behold, um, it's, a, um, it's, a, it's a sophisticated lawsuit. And I asked them, well, how did you get the idea of, of putting this together? And let me just scroll back for a second. He said, well, we, we live in Kentucky, and we read these arguments that were used against Andy Bashir, and where they had the word social gathering, we just put the words abortion. And we just substituted an argument about social gathering restrictions for abortion prohibitions, which was quite, um, quite a clever, uh, clever move. Um, in Indiana, uh, we've got a case called Anonymous Plaintiffs. I mentioned Hoosier's Juice for Choice. This is um, the state court judge, Heather Welsh, who uh, granted for the first time in American history a religious exemption from an abortion prohibition in December um, 2022. She's a state trial court judge. This case just went up to the State Court of Appeals in Indiana. I think, that, I think it's fair to say, and I'm happy to share a link um, to anyone who wants to watch it, but that the oral argument went quite badly for the state. In fact, I, I, it's hard to predict these cases, but it would not at all surprise me if the state loses uh, this case in the Court of Appeals and it goes up to the Indiana Supreme Court. I think we should know that fairly shortly. This case involved a state law challenge. Indiana has something called a uh, Religious Freedom Restoration Act at the state level. So after the peyote case, many states passed laws imposing this more stringent requirement. Um, so Indiana has a RIFRA. And interestingly, it was enacted by um, none other than Mike Pence. So the irony of the Indiana case is that uh, Judge Welsh is um, granting a religious exemption from an abortion prohibition using a religious freedom statute that was enacted uh, with Mike Pence as the governor of Indiana. And no small ironies here. Um, the trial court reasoning in Indiana was that the abortion prohibition there has various medical, uh, sorry, secular exceptions. One of them is a medical exception. In fact, the trial court did not rely on the medical exception there, partly, I think, because, uh, because it's controversial even in the vaccine cases, as we see in the New York and Maine cases. Instead, she says, look, this statute has rape and incest uh, exception. Right? Uh, for women um, who, are, who are victims in this way, they, they're entitled uh, to an exemption from the abortion prohibition. And if you grant exceptions that undermine the state's interest, and here the state articulates an interest in fetal life, an exception here would undermine that interest, would destroy a fetus, in the same way that a religious exception would. And so the argument is, if you're going to grant an exception that undermines that interest of the state in the same way that a religious exception, when you have to give a reason why you're not granting the religious exception, and the state doesn't have such a reason. I think even more important here actually are uh, permissions uh, uh, involving IVF. Most states, in fact, I think at this point all of them that have abortion prohibitions, um, in one way or another have, uh, have signaled that those prohibitions do not apply to IVF. But the IVF process often includes the destruction of fertilized eggs or embryos. Um, some of you who are medical professionals are going to know the terminology much better than I do. But, um, but no state has prohibited uh, the destruction of those fertilized eggs. And given the way that Indiana defends its interest, which is that any fertilized egg is a person under their law and is entitled to legal protection, they have to explain why they allow um, IVF procedures um, as they did before those abortion prohibitions went into effect, and they don't have an obvious answer to that question. In fact, in the first minute of oral argument about a month ago, uh, the state solicitor general who, representing Indiana in this uh, abortion religious freedom case was asked precisely that question by Judge Liana Weissman. She asked, what about IVF? And he just doesn't have uh, real answers to this question. So the, the strategy in these cases is to leverage secular exceptions uh, under the law in order to argue that religious exceptions must be granted. Uh, 
Uh, it's a creative strategy, but it's a strategy that builds on our jurisprudence and religious freedom that emerges from conservative justices, from Alito, from Gorsuch, from uh, Kavanaugh, Barrett, Thomas. Um, those justices applied that doctrine in quite stringent ways during COVID to grant religious exceptions from various kinds of public health regulations, and the argument is that the court, if it were principled, would have to do the same thing in these abortion cases. We don't yet have federal cases. These are state cases, and the reason they're state cases is in part because people want to be cautious. We don't expect conservative courts to apply the doctrine in the way that I'm suggesting. In fact, I expect them not to, but I think it's really hard for them to justify deviating from this, uh, this principle. That has led some conservative thinkers to, um, to strategies that um, I'm way past my 20 minutes, but I'll air this argument anyway, just so you get a sense of it. If, if the idea that any secular exception should trigger a religious accommodation works, then there's a lot of pressure to kick out these cases before, uh, before they really get going. And one way to do that would be to say that the plaintiffs don't satisfy the threshold conditions that I mentioned earlier to you. That is, you've got to have a sincere religious belief that's substantially burdened. And so some conservative legal thinkers have thought, well, once we're in this situation where the state has secular exceptions, you have to grant religious exceptions, it's too late. Like, it's really hard to defend the law at that point. A better way would be to say that these plaintiffs either don't have sincere religious beliefs or that their, their views aren't being substantially burdened. And we, we first saw an argument of this kind from a, a scholar named um, Josh Blackman. He's since retracted part of this argument, but I just want to air it for you anyway, as he initially framed it. So we have to have religious beliefs that are sincere and substantially burdened. And his argument went something like this. He said, to have a substantial burden on your religious belief or practice, it has to be the case that your, uh, that your religion points to some obligation and the argument here was that liberal Jews don't believe that halakha or Jewish law is binding, that it creates religious obligations. And so if they claim all of a sudden that, uh, that they have an obligation to terminate a pregnancy or to have an abortion, then they're contradicting themselves. They're saying, we don't really believe in religious obligations under Jewish law, but, um, but now we're saying we have an obligation to abort. And that is either insincere, either these Jewish plaintiffs are lying, or they're not obligated and they don't, they don't really have a substantial burden on their beliefs or practices. So the, the force of this argument is to put the plaintiffs on a dilemma to say either you're insincere, that is you're engaged in fraud, you're lying, or you're not substantially burdened. And these cases should just be dismissed at the front end before we get to any kinds of questions about whether, uh, whether there are exceptions that should trigger a religious accommodation. I wrote a piece with Dahlia Lithwick responding to this argument early on. This is a year and a half ago, I guess, or June 2022, um, where I basically said the logic of that argument is that Reformed Jews uh, don't have any religious obligations, could never assert a religious obligation, which in and of itself is absurd, but if you took it seriously uh, that Reformed Jews, other progressive Jews, have no religious obligations, and if a claim of religious freedom requires you to assert that you have some religious obligation, then, then if you step back, the, the general uh, conclusion of that argument is that Reformed Jews could never assert a claim of religious liberty. That's quite shocking, an even crazy kind of claim, absurd kind of claim. I think that's partly why Blackman has had to retract parts of it. It just doesn't stand up. But you can see that the, the pressure of the constitutional doctrine here is leading conservatives into, I think, into some uh, creative arguments of their own, trying to avoid uh, the logic of the, the underlying doctrine. And this was one, one sort of um, trial balloon to see if this would fly. I think it doesn't fly, and, uh, and there were quite strong responses at the outset. But, um, but I think we have to be on guard, looking, cautious for these kinds of claims that might affect not only these cases, but, but our religious liberty more generally. So uh, I hope that helps explain my subtitle, Can Liberal Jews Have Religious Freedom? And because I think some of the arguments used to try to reject these abortion claims have even more profound implications for our religious community. I'm going to stop there. Um, I'm happy to take questions about any of this and then some, uh, and thanks for hearing me out so far. All right.
Yeah. Right. The FBI goes in there and busts the developer. Right. So, uh, I mean, the thing about someone shaving their beard or the peyote is, is not as jarring, perhaps, as some of these other examples. Would yeah. they be able to come here and do female dupes and mutilation in that sort of it's a, it's a, It's a perfectly good and reasonable question, I think. What, what I mean, Scalia's, Scalia's argument was if we allow these kinds of accommodations, it's going to lead to all kinds of strange, absurd kinds of, um, give, me, give me one second to, can it's going to lead to all kinds of, um, I don't mean to put the anarchy point up here, this point, um, uh, although maybe, um, it, it'll lead to all kinds of, uh, of really terrible outcomes. So um, what about female genital mutilation? What about child marriage? What about bigamy? Um, these are all, uh, all laws that have been challenged on religious freedom grounds. Um, some more successfully than others. I think what I would want to say, and I think what the courts would say um, first, is that some of these rules don't have exceptions for uh, secular activities or secular forms of conduct. So there just are no conditions under which they would be granted. Now, you might think in some circumstances, maybe there would be medical reasons, for example, for certain kinds of surgery, but those reasons would serve the state's interest. Um, and so they wouldn't count in the same way that some of the uh, for example, the folliculitis exception would count, I think, is the way that Justice Alito would respond. Let me fill that in for just a second. In the Beards case, there was also a case for undercover police officers, an exemption for undercover police officers. Right? Undercover cops could, could wear beards. And Alito said, look, that, that kind of exception doesn't really count for purposes of comparing to a religious exception because it serves the state's interest for police to be able to, to wear a beard undercover. The only exceptions, the secular exceptions that are going to account for this purpose are exceptions that undermine the state, whatever the state's trying to do, in the same way that a religious exception would undermine that, that purpose of the state. So in the, in the female genital mutilation case, there might not be an exception that would trigger this rule. Um, the same thing might be true in the child marriage. We just don't allow exceptions to that rule. No one gets an exception. And so the law is, in Scalia's phrase, neutral and generally ap applicable. And so we don't, we don't allow exceptions. And the same might be true, this is a little more controversial in polygamy or bigamy uh, laws, there, there simply are no exceptions permitted. There's more of a history with respect to those laws in the United States. One of the earliest free exercise opinions that we have from the Supreme Court upheld a prohibition in Utah on, uh, on polygamy, um, that case called Reynolds against the United States from the late 1870s. Um, you know, there are courts that have set aside bigamy prosecutions uh, on other grounds. Uh, there was a district court in Utah, it's probably 10 years back or so. Those arguments are more controversial, but for reasons I think having more to do with other parts of constitutional law than religious freedom. But I think that, I think that the force of your question is to ask, could there be other kinds of prohibitions that we think are really important that are upset by the doctrine I'm describing? I would have told you one, one last thought on this. I would have told you that vaccine laws would have fallen into the same category that you're describing. That is, these are laws that are designed to protect public health, especially during pandemics or epidemics. And until the summer of, of 2021, no state or federal court in the history of the United States ever applied a free exercise provision to grant uh, an exemption from a vaccine requirement. Not a single case. There were cases, many, many cases over many decades. There are no examples of that. But we've got conservative justices on the Supreme Court, these three especially, who 
want to grant religious exceptions in those kinds of cases for the kinds of reasons I'm describing. And so I think it's a perfectly reasonable response to those cases and to the abortion cases that I'm describing to ask, what are the implications of this quite strong doctrine of religious freedom? What kinds of harms would be allowed to occur if this, um, if this is uh, permitted to go forward? And I think one answer to that is to say, well, that's a really important question, but if the court is going to apply the doctrine that it has laid out in a principled way, it has to grapple with that in a way that it hasn't so far. I think that's how I want to answer that question. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a question I've spent a lot of time thinking about, actually. Um, I wrote a paper uh, some years back called What If Religion Isn't Special? Uh, and the question, the question was meant to elicit this concern about non-religious grounds for uh, conscience. Uh, in the late 60s and early 70s, the Supreme Court heard two important cases called Seeger uh, and Welsh that involved um, non-believers who were uh, conscientious objectors for military draft purposes. They didn't want to fight in Vietnam. Um, and the court extended the conscientious objector provisions that applied to uh, people with religious objections to fighting to those non-believers. Those were statutory cases, not cases that directly implicated uh, the First Amendment. But a lot of scholars have thought um, that they were in the shadow of the First Amendment. That is, uh, it was constitutionally suspect to grant religious believers conscientious objector status, but not, uh, not grant um, the same kinds of accommodations for people with secular claims of conscience. Um, I think this Supreme Court would be a long way from those, the current Supreme Court would be a long way from those Vietnam draft protest cases. That is, this court seems to have a narrower understanding of religion, and I think it would, would restrict the scope of the kinds of challenges that could be brought. That is, if you're not articulating your claim of conscience in religious terms, I think you'd probably lose uh, in a First Amendment free exercise um, challenge at this point, or at least it would be much more difficult than it would have been decades ago. Um, I would say the politics of that point cut in different directions. One way that some courts have kicked out vaccine exemption claims is by saying they're not actually being brought on religious grounds. That is, people object to the science or they have personal beliefs that oppose to vaccinations. And so sometimes we see a narrower understanding of religion invoked in these vaccine cases as well. I would expect to see similar kinds of narrowing in these abortion appeals. There are some cases, uh, a couple of the cases in the states that I pointed out in the map in the beginning, involve the Satanic Temple, which is uh, a group that, the, the word Satanic triggers all kinds of um, immediate uh, thoughts, but as a group that represents itself as a humanist ethical group, they have in mind the Satan of Milton's Paradise Lost, maybe not the versions of Satan you might otherwise have in mind, and they want to press this point. They want to say, look, if we have secular ethical beliefs, we should get the same kind of treatment that religious, conventional or orthodox religious believers are getting. You know, their claims have not tended to fare very well. Um, there might be other reasons for that, but anyway. I, I don't know if that's a satisfactory answer to your question. I think the short answer is it's going to be a real problem. And probably, probably people with non-religious conscientious claims are not going to get the same kind of treatment in our system as those who have religious claims. Beth in the back. Yes. Uh, so a few different kinds of arguments are being made here. One, of course, is that in Jewish law, uh, we have a very different understanding of when life begins. 
Um, and so at the very least, uh, abortion is permitted uh, under some circumstances. Uh, under, under orthodox understandings of halakha, and then under more liberal or progressive understandings permitted in a wider range. Um, permission to engage in some religious conduct is usually not going to be sufficient to trigger a free exercise claim. That is, you might be permitted to do lots of things, and the law might prohibit you from doing some of those things, but just because you're permitted doesn't mean there's any real conflict, right? That's why Josh Blackman in the end of my talk says, you should have to show an obligation of some kind but in between being permitted and being obligated, there's a range of behavior, and some of it might, we might classify as having uh, religious values or religious motivation that guide you to make a decision, even if you're not required to do it. It still might be other things equal the, the best thing for you to do on religious grounds, even if you're not absolutely required by your religion to do that. In these cases, uh, the women plaintiffs, especially the name plaintiffs, has said several things. One, one is using IVF. So if that practice is prohibited, uh, that would be uh, an infringement on, on uh, her uh, religious values. She wants to have children. She thinks this, this is grounded in, uh, in mitzvot and in, in Jewish values and Jewish commandment. Um, others um, have at-risk at pregnancies or, or would be at high risk in their pregnancies and want to know that if they've confronted uh, conflict between um, their health and the health of their fetus, that um, they would be able to prioritize their health, which is, uh, again, consistent with, uh, with, with Jewish understandings of, of um, the relevant values uh, and legal, Jewish legal sources here. Um, I think those are the primary uh, our, our religious arguments, um, uh, protecting uh, the ability to have children and the ability um, to, uh, to to have a pregnancy that respects maternal health. Um, at the, um, f I think there, there's an additional set of arguments that under some circumstances abortions would even halakhically under an orthodox understanding be, be required, not, not just consistent with Jewish value and motivated by those values, but in fact halakhically required. That is, where the mother's life is at risk. And that might be, there might be space between what the state protects in those circumstances and what would be halakhically uh, uh, required, right? I mean, the, the Jewish law might be willing to intervene in, uh, in, in protecting maternal life much earlier than some states are willing. And we've seen some pretty dramatic examples in the last couple months, uh, including one woman, as you know, fleeing from Texas. Um, in those circumstances, Jewish law might step in to, to protect that mother. Um, so those, there's a range of arguments, I think, that are being articulated in the litigation. And I expect that those arguments will be developed more fully as the litigation continues. Interestingly, we haven't seen any pushback so far on the religious side. One uh, litigation shop, the Beckett Fund, challenged the sincerity of the plaintiffs in Indiana, I think in a really shocking brief. Um, not in the same way that Blackman did uh, in other ways, but, um, but I don't think the courts are going to go for that argument in Indiana. The, uh, the case that seems to have drawn our attention early on about religious liberty, I guess, was the Burwell versus Hobby Lobby. I mean, Hobby Lobby is, I think, for the six conservative justices on the Supreme Court, completely non-controversial. That is, I mean, I, they they reinforced it with a set of decisions uh, in the in the years after Hobby Lobby, including after Justice Scalia died and was replaced uh, by Justice Gorsuch. Um, case called Little Sisters, uh, which was um, brought by Pennsylvania, trying to protect the. Uh, the rights of workers in Pennsylvania um, to access um, seamless uh, insurance for contraception. The Supreme Court swatted that away. And interestingly, and this picks up on something else that you said, interestingly, the Supreme Court had no time, none at all, for any um, argument about the harms that might befall 
uh, workers, third parties, people who were not represented in the litigation, either in Hobby Lobby or in Little Sisters. So one argument I've heard in response to these abortion claims is, well, what about the interests of the third party here, which in this case, at least from a conservative perspective, is the fetus, right? So if you care about the workers in Hobby Lobby, maybe you should care about the third party interests in the abortion context too. I mean, one answer to that is these justices don't seem to have any concern for the harms that religious accommodations seem to lead to in vaccine cases or in contraception uh, coverage, insurance coverage cases, or, uh, in the public health cases that were brought during COVID. It would be interesting, I think, to say the least, for them all of a sudden to resuscitate an argument from the harms that might befall third parties uh, in these cases, uh, in the abortion cases. The other problem is that the state seems to allow exceptions that harm others in, uh, in some of these uh, the cases we're describing here and in the abortion context. And then the state has to give an account of why burdens on third parties are permissible in some circumstances but in other, and not in others. Again, I, I think I, part of my argument is the court should be principled about how it applies that concern. I think there are gonna be other arguments, obviously, in the abortion context about, um, about to what extent fetal interests uh, um, come into play here. I also think they come in earlier in the argument for technical reasons. We could talk about it, but, um, but there's some twists here. The, but the, yeah, the, the bottom line is Hobby Lobby is, I think for most of uh, the justices on the current Supreme Court, a fairly straightforward decision. It was written, the majority opinion, by Justice Alito, who we've seen, we've seen here. Um, so you can see how that might go. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of things. <laughs> um, uh, some of these cases have raised challenges to the grounds of the abortion prohibitions. Uh, the idea is that because they're religiously motivated, these laws infringe on the establishment clause of the First Amendment. Um, uh, Americans United for Separation Church and State filed um, a case in Missouri along these lines. Uh, in uh, in state court under their state constitutional provisions that disestablish religion. We've got some uh, federal cases raising establishment clause challenges in Florida, but they're not really going anywhere at the moment. Um, that argument was raised in the US Supreme Court in a case called the Harris v. McRae in the 80s, and the Supreme Court rejected it, which is part of the reason that I haven't focused on this kind of argument now. And it rejected it because it thought, well, the fact that a law happens to coincide with some religious beliefs is not a sufficient basis for rejecting it under the Establishment Clause. So just to give you an example, a murder statute is going to be justified by many legislators and the fact that it, it conforms with the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not murder. The fact that it has a religious grounding for some legislators or even, even for many people in our society is not a reason to undermine or to reject a murder statute on Establishment Clause grounds. And some people have thought the same is going to be true for uh, for abortion statutes. I don't think that that's quite right, um, partly because there's really no religious disagreement with the foundations of murder statutes. All religions converge on this in a way that they don't with respect to the religious beliefs that underlie abortion prohibitions. And a second point is that the Supreme Court, and this is more complicated and might take more time to develop, but in some recent cases the Supreme Court has said when political officials show hostility for some religious perspectives, by expressing uh, objections to, uh, to those religious beliefs, that showing of, of hostility or animus against religion can be a basis for uh, rejecting the application of that law. So let me, let me give you an example. There's a case called Masterpiece Cake Shop involving a baker out of Colorado. And what the Supreme Court said in Masterpiece Cake Shop was um, that the Colorado civil rights uh, officials uh, expressed themselves in ways that showed hostility toward the baker. And because they showed hostility, uh, they could not apply their 
public accommodations, their anti-discrimination law to his business. Um, it's not hard, I think, to find examples of expressions of hostility toward uh, religious perspectives that are pro-choice uh, in the legislatures that have passed uh, abortion restrictions since Dobbs. In fact, I had a team of research assistants just watching legislative hearings and asking, you know, how are legislators expressing themselves? And sometimes they do it in ways that are overtly religious, but not only religious in their own terms, but also I think it's fair to say, at least according to the court's description in Masterpiece Cake Shop, they do it in a way that could be construed as hostile um, to other perspectives. There's a very easy example out of Kentucky where in response to a legislator who proposes a religious accommodation for uh, for Jews and other religious minorities um, who object to the abortion prohibition, he just goes on an anti-Semitic rant. I mean, it's just blatantly anti-Semitic. I, I mean, uh, you can watch it on YouTube. I mean, it's all all out there, right? So I, so in a paper, in a longer paper on this, I say, look, if this again, if the Supreme Court is consistent about how it applies its doctrine, it should say these prohibitions that are based on some kind of underlying hostility to competing religious views should be closely scrutinized. Um, I think that there's a stronger establishment clause argument generally, but it's just very clear that this conservative majority on the Supreme Court is not going to go anywhere near it. They're going to reject it out of hand. The only question is, will there be some state courts that embrace it? And we just don't know the answer to that question yet. I think the free exercise claim that I've spent our time today talking about is more promise. It's a strong, it's stronger argument given the doctrine we have. I don't know that it will be successful. In fact, I predict in federal courts it won't be. but at least it puts the court to a test. Like, are you gonna apply your principles uh, in a way that has some integrity? Or in the establishing clause context, they'll just say, we've dealt with this in the 80s and we're not going back to it. Yeah. You mean e ethically? Oh, oh yes, I think very much. So the Supreme Court, in the way that it thinks about uh, religious freedom, has what's called a hands-off approach to uh, to religious beliefs. That is, um, and this is long-standing uh, legal doctrine in, in the United States, and I think uh, very importantly so. The Supreme Court does not test the truth of an underlying religious view. It's not going to ask, is the halakhic understanding of when life begins the true understanding of when life begins? I mean, that would be to put the Supreme Court in the role of determining religious truth, and we do not want federal judges in that business. And federal judges know that, and even I would say here, the conservative Supreme Court justices that I've mentioned before, they're not interested, I think, also in making those kinds of determinations. And in fact, in Hobby Lobby, where uh, the Green family that owned Hobby Lobby had, I think, some quite uh, contested and controversial views about, for example, what counts as an abortifacient, as a drug that causes an abortion, the court said, we're not going to make that determination. That's for them to make. The only question on, on the judge's side is, is the view sincere? And in the Jewish context, I think there's no question about the sincerity. These views have been held for centuries. They're not new. They weren't developed to get out of these abortion restrictions. They're not there's nothing strategic about them, right? Um, so we have to publicly articulate that understanding because it's not familiar to many Americans and, and including to some, uh, to some state and federal judges, they have to be educated, we have to express that. And I, in fact, I went to the, um, to the URJ and to the RAC to, to say as much, to say you know, Jewish beliefs have to be um, expressed here. We, we do need rabbinic authorities and other groups to help uh, courts understand our perspective. It's not only our perspective for that. I mean, we, we do have um, a particular understanding and ethics based on our tradition, but uh, there are mainline Protestants and other religious groups, for example, that do um, that do broadly share 
some version of, of our understanding of the fetus developing over time. Yeah, it is. It's clearly expressed in Indiana and in Kentucky. The litigants themselves are making it. There are amicus briefs, friends of the court briefs, that are articulating the Jewish understanding of when life begins um, to help those courts see that these, these religious freedom claims are grounded in a tradition, in an understanding of, of Jewish law. Yeah, absolutely. I just I don't expect federal courts are gonna, or state courts are going to challenge those beliefs. They've got no business doing that. Well... That, well, they, I mean, the Indiana court did, right? The lower court, uh, the trial court, and, the, and we'll see about the Court of Appeals did. I mean, but whether they honor them is a separate question. That's really a question about federal and state law and how it interacts with religious beliefs. But, but they're not, I think, going, if they dishonor, if they don't respect them, I think it won't be because they don't, don't see them as, a rep, as an accurate representation of the religious community's views. It'll be because... Um, It'll either be because there are the harms that follow are too great or because they credit the state's interest or for other kinds of reasons that have to do, I think, with, with the, under, their understanding of how constitutional law interacts with those religious beliefs. Yeah. I would expect that many courts will not respect those religious views. In fact, I predict, predict as much. Yeah. There, there are questions of standing. They're not in these cases so far, or at least not that I know. The named plaintiffs are not pregnant currently. Um, so there are issues of standing in both the Kentucky and Indiana cases. Some other cases have been brought on behalf of clergy who want to assist and advise their, uh, their congregants with respect to um, decisions about whether to terminate pregnancy. So the Florida cases involve members of clergy. There's a question about whether they have standing. Um, abortion cases have always raised standing questions. Um, so you know, do we do you have to have a pregnant person uh, to raise a claim? You know, I, I, if the answer to that question is yes, then it's just a matter of time before that happens. Um, that eventually, it will happen. I mean, these state prohibitions on abortion are not going to be retracted anytime soon. I think for many of them, uh, and in some of these states, the state supreme courts are not going to do what the Pennsylvania court did, so it won't grant constitutional rights. Um, maybe by referendum in some of them, uh, we'll see. But but any event, I expect to see challenges eventually. And if these cases are kicked out on standing grounds, which is certainly a possibility, um, then, you know, then I think there'll be future challenges along similar lines until the court finally does address it. The last point on your question, there were cases raising free exercise challenges before Roe v. Wade, and some of those cases were kicked out on standing grounds. There were standing issues in Roe itself, right, because as you know, the, old, the old saying here is that um, litigation takes longer than gestation, so... Um, <laughs> I think there was a hand in the back here. Yeah, uh, thanks for this question. Um, the answer for conservative Jews, I think, is very much yes. And one conservative Jewish woman is presented in the Kentucky case by name. Um, uh, with respect to Orthodox Jews, there are some Orthodox plaintiffs in the Missouri case challenging that law on state establishment clause grounds, disestablishment arguments. Uh, they don't raise the kind of religious liberty claim I'm talking about for the most part in this talk, but there are other kinds of arguments where Orthodox Jews have come in as plaintiffs. Um, I can imagine Orthodox Jews making religious freedom arguments in certain kinds of cases. For example, uh, in a rape or incest case, I think there would be uh, grounds for a claim of the kind I'm describing. In some medical exception cases where the state doesn't provide enough latitude under its medical exceptions, all states that have abortion prohibitions have some medical exceptions, but many of them are very stringent. I can imagine a, an Orthodox uh, Jewish plaintiff raising a claim, but we haven't seen them yet. The Orthodox Jewish groups have been very careful in their amicus presence in the, these cases so far, and they haven't. Uh, uh, the, uh, the main representation of the Orthodox community hasn't weighed in. There, has, there have been some uh, uh, Orthodox uh, scholars, writers, uh, uh, at least in one amicus brief, who've opposed granting these exceptions. Other questions? Maybe I've exhausted you. Yeah, no, okay. <laughs> <laughs>
That's right. Yeah, Scientologists are always this um, borderline test case. Uh, so I, I don't know about Scientologists. Um, before the peyote case, so from roughly 19, early 1960s through 1990, the Supreme Court only granted uh, religious exemptions in five cases. Um, four of them involved unemployment compensation benefits, mostly workers who didn't want to work on a Saturday, Jehovah's Witnesses, Seventh-day Adventists, who objected to working on the Sabbath. Uh, one, uh, one Jehovah's Witness who didn't want to work in an armament factory in a particular job. Um, and then the peyote case comes up. It's also an unemployment compensation case. The Native Americans who wanted to use peyote were fired from their jobs. They were working at a drug rehab clinic, which was, yeah, that was hard. Um, but, right, but um, uh, that's a long story, which I'm happy to say more about. But in any event, these were unemployment compensation cases. The only other case from 1962 to 1990 involved the Amish in Wisconsin who wanted an accommodation from the compulsory education statute. They don't want to educate their children after the age of 14, and the Supreme Court let them out. And you're right that in New York there are yeshivas that don't educate their children in English, and uh, you know they, their students are failing standardized uh, tests for grades and whatnot. So it's, it is the case that we have exemptions on the books that seem to favor some uh, religious groups over others, and the question I take it is, what about in this context are we going to see courts favor some groups over others, including favor, uh, for example, um, evangelicals and other uh, conservative um, Christian groups who seem to have been successful in Hobby Lobby or in these vaccine cases or in these social gathering cases over, for example, liberal and progressive or maybe conservative Jews too uh, in these abortion cases. Um, and in a much longer paper with the same title as this talk, uh, Rich Schrager and I have argued that we expect to see that kind of favoritism. We call it preferentialism. That is when the court engages in a preference of some denominations over others. The court's never going to say that it does that explicitly. It's never going to say we're biased in favor of one religion over the other. But it turns out that judges are people too and they know and have sympathies that lie more in some directions than in others. And it's not hard to anticipate that in any religious exemption regime, some groups are going to get exemptions and some aren't. And the question is, is there some common principle that helps explain why? And the burden of my argument in this talk is to say, if they don't grant religious exceptions in the abortion context, it's going to be very hard to understand why. It will look like a case of favoritism. They should grant these exceptions. Now, maybe they shouldn't have this doctrine. Maybe Alito was wrong in the folliculitis case. Maybe we should trace all the way back to that initial starting point. We should say, you know what? A law can be general, can apply to all of us, even if there are some minor exceptions. A grant exception for folliculitis doesn't mean we have to grant an exception for anyone with a religious exception. Maybe that was a bad idea. Maybe that led to, a, maybe that led to anarchy, right? The way that Scalia says. But that's not the law we have today. And under the law we have today, these exceptions should follow. And if the court's going to be principled, fine, right? Then we should hold its feet to the fire, and that's what I take myself to be trying to do. Sure, happy to. Marty? You know, the, the way I've described this single secular exception approach, if you grant any secular exceptions, you've got you know, to show why you shouldn't also have to grant religious exceptions. I don't think there's anything like this uh, in the founding era. And more importantly, none of the justices who embrace this doctrine have ever shown that there is. So if you think that they're textualists, they seem to be selective in their textualism. Um, now, Justice Alito, in a decision a couple of years ago involving the city of Philadelphia and Catholic Social Services, an adoption agency case, wrote a long opinion saying he thinks that the 
the idea that Scalia called anarchical, that that idea, that any time the state burdens a sincere religious practice, it should have to show that it has a powerful reason. He thinks, and many liberal justices before him thought, that that view is grounded uh, in uh, various state constitutional texts and in the First Amendment. That is, he interprets the First Amendment to endorse that view. I should say that the view that Scalia kicked out as anarchical, let me come back really quickly, this view, the idea that judges should apply very stringent review to laws that burden religion. In the early 1960s, this was a liberal view. It was taken up by, uh, by William Brennan, who was the liberal lion of the Warren Court, and Thurgood Marshall, and other liberal justices. The Peyote case, which rejected that view, was seen as a conservative opinion by Justice Scalia. Scalia said, you liberals are just creating anarchy. You're and granting religious freedom as a civil right, you're gonna let all these religious minorities do whatever they want. The politics of that have completely flipped. Right? Now you've got liberal groups saying, maybe we shouldn't grant all these exceptions, and you've got conservative justices. Right? Again, I'm coming back to the ones I showed you before, you know, just as three of them, right? Scorsuch, Alito, Thomas, who are saying, no, if you grant secular exceptions, you have to grant all these religious exceptions. So exceptions from social gathering, exceptions from vaccinations, exceptions in Hobby Lobby, right? All of these exceptions, um, they reject Scalia's uh, argument about anarchy. They've come around to what had been the liberal view. So the politics of this are topsy-turvy. They've done a complete 180 on. The liberals are worried about exemptions in, from anti-discrimination laws with respect to, to businesses discriminating against uh, the LGBTQ community from exemptions from public health rules, vaccines, social gathering, whatnot. Conservatives want to grant exceptions to all of those laws. So the politics here are, have changed. They've been revolutionized, really, since, since uh, 1990. Yeah. Yeah. We, don't, we just don't know the answer to this. So it would be a really strange situation if you had somebody who could get a religious exception but no health care provider who could, who could fulfill it. Right? So there would be a question about remedies in these cases. Um, the trial court in Indiana enjoined the application of the law to the plaintiffs. And it would be a question about how they could go about satisfying that remedy. Um, I, the short answer is we just don't know really what, how this would be institutionalized and how far courts would go in granting remedies that would allow providers and uh, hospitals the immunities that they would absolutely have to have before they'd be willing to, to provide it. Um, uh, there's more to say about that, but that's the, that's the first answer. Yeah, there's a lot of work to do on that question. Sure, happy, happy to say. Yeah.